Okay, well, welcome everyone to Digital Hammurabi. This uh, screen probably looks a little bit different. And uh, that's because my system, for some reason, has decided that it just does not want to send out the right link. Um, but Dr. Collins has worked with me and uh, very, very graciously, and I really appreciate your patience because I got to tell you, I, I don't know if I would have been quite as patient. <laughs> so uh, I thank you for that. Uh, but Dr. Collins, welcome. I'll, I'll give you a little introduction here, but uh, just uh, thank you for your patience and for uh, just working things through with me. Welcome. Well, uh, okay. So Dr. Collins uh, is uh, Dr. John J. Collins. He is the uh, Holmes Professor of Old Testament Criticism uh, and Interpretation at Yale Divinity School. Uh, Dr. Collins earned his PhD from Harvard University. Uh, and before coming to Yale, he taught first, I think it was first at Notre Dame and then the University of Chicago after? Yes, but I taught at other places before that too. Okay. My first teaching job was at University College Dublin. Oh, wow. In 1972 to 73. Mm. And I taught at a seminary in Chicago for several years. And then at DePaul. And then Notre Dame. Wow. And then Chicago. Quite, quite a quite a resume here, quite a CV, yeah, everyone. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so among the various areas of specialization that Dr. Collins has uh, and has become very well known for, uh, for example, is work on the Book of Daniel, the wider genre of apocalyptic literature, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the list goes on and on, believe me. He has recently published a book um, entitled What Are Biblical Values? And that book is right here, and I have the link in the description below, and it's very reasonably priced. It's very well put together. It's a nice hardback, um, but and it's it's a. I don't want to call it an easy read because I guess in some ways it's an easy read, in other ways it's a, it can be a jarring sort of read. But uh, and it's an excellent book. I just read it again before the stream, um, so please go pick up pick up your copy of that. Um, yeah, I, I highly recommend it. So that leads me to today. What we are focusing on uh, are some of the moral issues that appear particularly in the Hebrew Bible. Now, his book deals with both the you know the Old and New Testaments, uh, but we're going to try to focus today on the Hebrew Bible, particularly with respect um, to issues of violence and genocide uh, as depicted in the Old Testament. So we'll also discuss passages, if we have time, um, that come up in discussions about abortion social justice, even slavery. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to get to as much of that as we can. I, I, I really want to respect Dr. Collins' time, so we're going to do uh, 45 minutes if that's okay. That'll put us right at the 3 o'clock mark. I know it's a little bit longer than... Yeah. Um, and then we'll take maybe 10 or 15 minutes for questions. So um, if you want to take a, take a minute and just kind of introduce yourself to everybody and, um, you know, you don't have to be... Uh, oh, I think you, you, you've done enough. I've done that. it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's get into the substance. And then, Copy that. Uh, Copy yeah. that. I, um, well, I sent Dr. Collins the questions that I wanted to ask him, so I'm going to do this very um, very woodenly, but I think it is probably the best way to get into the material. So the first question that I wanted to ask is, there is a common notion um, that the ancient world was an immoral place and that the Old Testament greatly developed morality and ethics. In your book, you address many of the values that are presented in the biblical texts. Would you take a minute and generally speak to this idea and how we should understand, in general, uh, morality in the ancient world and more specifically in the biblical texts? I don't know that uh, the ancient world was any more immoral in its way than the modern world. You know, I see you have the Ishtar gate displayed there behind you. You use the, the uh, code name Digital Hammurabi. Um, you know, uh, that was a very good book by David Wright, who teaches at Brandeis, on the inventing God's law, arguing that a core section of the law in the Pentateuch was adapted from the Code of Hammurabi. Now, this is controversial, it may, not, it may or may not be right. I found it fairly persuasive. But I think, you know, at the beginning of the Code of Hammurabi, uh, you have 
the, the statement that he was called to administer justice. And what that meant was so that the rich would not oppress the poor. Basically, that was it. Everybody in the ancient world paid lip service to it. Now, whether they did it is another matter, but you know, do they do it nowadays? Mm. We all pay lip service to it nowadays too. So uh, there's a very good book also by a man named Jeremiah Unterman called And Justice for All, uh, making the case you know, that the Hebrew Bible stands out in that respect, in the, the clarity and insistence of its call for social justice, especially. And I think that's true, you know, um, that there is better literature out there in many respects. You know, I think maybe the Greek tragedians had more insight into human nature in some ways. Uh, the philosophers certainly did in some ways. Nobody had that straightforward, insistent call for justice that you get in the Hebrew prophets. So that, to my mind, you know, is what makes the Hebrew Bible still worth reading. Mm. Now, does that mean that they were all on a superior level? Uh, unfortunately not. Unfortunately not. Uh, and you mentioned in your remarks at the beginning, I think, the, the question of violence. And that is one of the areas. You know, it's one of the areas, not the only one. Mm by any means, where the Bible maybe rises sometimes a little bit above its environment and sometimes doesn't rise above it at all. Mm. So maybe that'll get us started. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting when I think about, of course, my, my background is a seriology, so I got my, my PhD from um, Johns Hopkins University. And you know, one of the things that I think about when I think about um, social justice and aspects of um, those, you know, that, that type of elevation is that where we see it, and you mentioned it, you know, in the prophets, the prophets, you know, calling for this, um, you know, equity. So I think of Jeremiah 34 and, you know, calling for the freedom of the slaves. And, um, and it's interesting, you know, if you read through, you know, Akkadian proverbial text, you'll see sometimes, it's not often, at least not to my knowledge, You'll see, uh, you know, don't uh, you know, tr treat your enemy well and do do well to those that it's it's, it's very golden rule ish. Yeah. Um, for the for the gods love this, you know, for Shamash loves this. Yeah. But but when you when you look at the legal text, it's exactly as you say, and I think I think even so in the Hebrew Bible, it's there's this, um, uh, you know, look out for the orphan, look out for the widow, look out for the oppressed. But when you get to the prophets, I think you're absolutely right. It it really does seem to be much clearer. It comes on, and it's much more frequent. Mm. You know, I mean, you get it in some of the law books too, Deuteronomy. Uh, you know, Deuteronomy is this great schizophrenic book where, where you have some wonderful stuff on justice. And then you also have the command to slaughter the Canaanites. Yeah. You know, the, the philosopher Walter Benjamin said there is no great monument of civilization, but isn't also a monument of barbarism. Mm. I think that that holds true, and it holds true of the Bible as well. Yeah. You know, that's just part of the human condition. Mm. Yeah. Well, that sort of leads us into the second question. So one of the issues that we encounter, particularly here on social media, is the problem of violence in the Hebrew Bible. The God of the Old Testament appears to either command or perform violent actions that we would consider today to be immoral. A common apologetic to this charge of immorality is to say that these stories of violence or genocide were merely hyperbolic. Could you speak to the violence either committed or commanded by God in the Hebrew Bible and how it should be understood in its context? Were these merely hyperbolic uh, statements or does the narrative expect the reader to understand that these commands of violence and genocide were genuine and from God. A lot there, sorry. Well, uh, you know, it is, I suppose, uh, a complex question in its way. It is very, first of all, uh, I mean, it is not the case that God came down and told them to do these things. You know, when you get a divine command in the Bible, 
It is some human being telling you that this is what God commands. And whenever you get that, ancient or modern, it's always at the very least mixed in with human motivations, human interests, and sometimes entirely the product of human motivations and human interests. Now, the, the show piece example you see, is the conquest story. Now, the conquest story, if you read through beginning with Deuteronomy with the command that when you go into the land, you know, leave no one alive, practically. And then the book of Joshua gives you the impression that Joshua actually did that. Now, the book of Judges, as I'm sure you know, is much more ambivalent about it. It gives you long lists of people that they didn't destroy, but it blames them for not destroying them. Now, the, the modern consensus for what it's worth is that the violent conquest of Canaan didn't occur. Now, the main argument on that is archaeological. We would expect to find, you know, a whole series of places that had been destroyed at the appropriate time, beginning with Jericho, the showpiece. Mm. And as of now, the archaeologists do not find these. I think there are an archaeologist or two, maybe, who still think Hatzor may have been dis destroyed by the Israelites, but the majority view uh, Bill Deaver, you know, is probably the most forceful and articulate archaeologist of his generation, was also very much opposed, you know, to the minimalists, to the people mm -hmm. who wanted to deny the historicity of a lot of the Old Testament. But at the same time, he says, you know, these things just didn't happen. Uh, now, does that relieve the problem? You see, I think not. Maybe it makes us feel a little bit less squeamish if we don't have to imagine that they actually pulled Canaanite women out of bed and slaughtered them. Uh, but still, it's there in the text, presented as a divine command. And then, you see, it stands as, uh, as a paradigm. Mm. The danger of putting things in writing, as we all know all too well, is that people will make of them of what you have written what they will. Mm. <laughs> and uh, in this case, you see, it isn't really difficult to use those texts as a kind of license for violence. And this has happened repeatedly. Mm. You know, it happened in the, uh, the spread of Christianity in this country. It uh, has happened in South Africa. It's happened in, happening in modern Israel. Um, so, you know, the, those texts are not innocent that way. Is it just hyperbole? I think not. Um, you know, there's a, a philosopher, um, Nick, um, blank again his name, <laughs> who wrote a, a book on Nick Walterstorff, uh, who has a you know, makes a nice argument saying how he talked to the, this high school kid who had played a football game and he said, oh, we slaughtered them. To which I say, nice try, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, granted, it was hyperbolic. And, you know, you've studied uh, the Assyriological stuff. They were all hyperbolic. Mm. But to say that they were hyperbolic didn't mean they didn't kill people. You know, they did what they could and claimed to have done more. Mm. But what you get fairly consistently is the glorification and violence. Now, I mean, this isn't peculiar to the ancient world either. This is, uh, you know, uh, think, think of the Western, the movie genre. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you ultimately settle things by violence? That's deeply ingrained. And we just did this past week. What should you do if there are demonstrations getting out of hand? Send in the army. Mm. Well, it's not the same syndrome, it seems to me. Now, you know, there are exceptions to that in the Bible. Uh, that's the remarkable part. 
A famous one would be the suffering servant in Isaiah of um, an attempt to make, uh, make suffering redemptive, which then had huge influence in early Christianity. But mind you, early Christianity doesn't altogether dispense with the violence either, uh, because in the end, you end up with the book of Revelation. And Jesus may have been a nice guy the first time, but boy, don't get in his way when he comes back. And that's an interesting aspect um, because I, I, you know, I think about you write off, uh, so prolifically um, well, and, and, and work on the field of apocalypticism and this dualistic aspect. Um, yeah, I think you talk about it actually in the book where you end up with good on one side, evil on the other. Uh, and the, the remedy is uh, for this weakened, perhaps population, uh, or often weakened population to say, well, we can't, we can't do anything ourselves. Uh, but, but God is going to come back in the end and he's going to do this violence um, yeah. on our behalf. Now, you know, one of the intriguing questions to me uh, is in the New Testament, when Jesus talks about turning the other cheek, is that premised on the belief that God will come back and destroy the wicked for you? I think if you read it in its canonical context, that's certainly how it's put. Mm. You know, we can afford to let the wheat and the tares grow together until the fall and then the harvest will come and the tares will be thrown into the fire. And now whether that's what Jesus meant, that's, that's an area I'm very hesitant to go into. Uh, <clears throat> very, very difficult to, to pin that down. Mm. But I think you know, it's a possibility. I'm not sure it's right, but I think it is a possibility. And I, I, I want to ask you, you know, before we move on to the next question, uh, thinking about, because th this aspect of hyperbole, um, it ends up being like, you know, Lawson Younger writes his dissertation in 1990, I think. The book gets published in the JSOT series. And, you know, he's comparing the Assyrian um, and, you know, the Egyptian inscriptions and saying, well, look, it, this is war rhetoric, right? This is hyperbole. And so when you look at Joshua, what, 9 to 12, that's what this is. And, you know, I'm, I'm okay with that to a certain degree. I think there probably are some parallels. I don't know what I think about taking these individual syntams and trying to figure out, you know, are there parallels? I think that can be dangerous. But nonetheless, I, there probably is something there. But what I, what I suspect is that you end up like a kid with a hammer, right? Everything becomes a nail. So if you've got this idea that, oh, hyperbole here in Joshua 9 to 12, well, anywhere I see violence and I can use hyperbole to get out of it, um, I'll do it. So when you, know, when you come to a passage like 1 Samuel 15 with the Amalekites, boom, at that hyperbole. The problem is, and, and even, in, in, you know, even in the conquest account, when you look at the, I mean, you, obviously you know this far better than I do, but you, you look at the use of haram or harem and, and the, this ban language, and you look at a place like Jericho, Jericho is, the, the, the point is that nobody's left, right? Rahab and her family, that's the exception. Um, so this idea of there being everything's gone except for this, or everything is wiped out except for this, and certainly in 1 Samuel 15, I mean, Saul is, he's condemned, he's rejected ultimately because of this, and Samuel has to go take up a, you know, a dagger and kill the king, but it's because he didn't carry this out. So like, what are your thoughts on that type of broad application of, of hyperbole? Or, or do you think there's anything to it? And if so, what do you think the limits are to its use? Well, uh, you see, hyperbole, uh, in order to have hyperbole, you have to have something to hyperbolize, if you know what I mean. Mm. And as you know well, in the case of the Assyrians, they were hyperbolic. Sure. Does that mean they didn't kill anybody? Right. Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Now, they probably killed a lot more people than Joshua did. Maybe the whole story of Joshua is fiction, but nonetheless, you know, it holds up an ideal. That's the mm -hmm. problem. Yeah. And if Joshua didn't do it, 
there have been plenty of other people who did. Mm. So now I might add, I'm not a pacifist, really. I think there are, there are times when violence may be the best of a bad selection. Mm. I don't think it's ever a good thing. It's, yeah. uh, you know, it, it, it's last recourse. Uh, the, the, the saving grace, if you like, of the, the Hebrew Bible is that most of the time they didn't have the power to kill anybody. Mm. And for the whole second temple period, you see, they were very weak people. It's only when the Maccabees come along mm. and when they do, they look back to Phineas, to the zeal of Phineas, to get your spear and run people through. Well, no, uh, I think, you know, in their time, I don't really have a quarrel with the Maccabees. Uh, they may have gotten carried away some of the time, but uh, in their context, I don't think they were shining moral examples, but they weren't, uh, they, they weren't scandalous either. Mm. They were more or less normal mm. in that regard. And I have a certain amount of sympathy for the zealots, you know, who rose up against Rome. It's ambivalent, of course, because in that case, the results were disastrous. Mm. But still, uh, what happens much more typically in the later part of the Hebrew Bible is that the violence gets attributed to God. Mm. And now that has had a long history of effects uh, in Christianity, especially. It, again, Judaism until very recently didn't have the power. But I think, you know, it's not that some people are better than others, really, but uh, people who have power over others tend to use it. And I think this has happened in, uh, in modern Israel, and it's often happened in Christianity, mm. certainly. And you see, that's the danger, to my mind, of having a sacred text that glorifies this kind of thing. Even if you're saying that it's God who will stamp on the nations like somebody stamps on a wine press. Because then what do you do with it? Mm. Now, as you will probably be aware, I am Irish. Uh, Irish history looms large in my consciousness. I wasn't in, I never lived in Northern Ireland, and I certainly wasn't there during the Troubles, but I was very much aware of what was going on there. And one of the things that was going on there was that there was a fundamentalist preacher named Ian Paisley, who you know, would thunder from the heavens about how God was going to smite these people and so forth. Now, he could say that he never told anybody to go out and kill anyone. Whether anybody then did act because of his sermons, you would have difficulty proving, but it's hard not to suspect that he did. Yeah. You know, we had a, a case like that in this country a few years ago of uh, a certain politician using ads, putting targets on the back of people. Mm. And then some person of the opposing party was in fact shot. Was there culpability there? Now, of course, you can prove that the person who pulled the trigger looked at that, but it's hard to imagine that these things are not in the end interconnected. Yeah. You know, words have, have force, words have meaning and have effects. So that's, I think, the, the, the moral problem there. Now, you know, it seems to me, I mean, one way of reading the New Testament part on it, and uh, I, you know, I've toyed with this, I'm not really a New Testament scholar and uh, I'm a little bit uh, hesitant to take too strong a stand on it. But, you know, as you have it in the Gospels, you have a lot of apocalyptic imagery. And then you also have some very non-apocalyptic sounding stuff like turn the other cheek, very atypical of, uh, of that kind of discourse. And it seems to me that what somebody did, whether it was Jesus or the evangelists, is to use the, the, to, to use the expectation of divine intervention to say you don't need to do anything in the present, to, to make that uh, a support for tolerance and forbearance. Mm. 
Mm. Now, there's some connection. You get some of that in the Jewish apocalypses. In the book of Daniel, I think the expectation of divine intervention is a reason why you can then afford to let yourself get killed. Mm -hmm. But I think the Gospels go a step beyond that because you know, they, they actually uh, advocate tolerance. And tolerance is a very unapocalyptic virtue. Mm -hmm. This is one of the interesting things that I see um, just before we move uh, on to the next question. No, I keep saying that, but this is so interesting to me. Um, is this idea that when you have a mindset that says, I am wholly right and the other is wholly wrong. You mentioned this in the book. This, how is it that you put it? it when you're right and they're wrong, it leaves no room for negotiation, which is violence is then the only thing that's left. And I think that's very dangerous um, in certain brands of, of, of religion in general. But I think of what I came out of very fundamentalist conservative Christianity, you know, that's, that's a very real mindset. Um, we have the truth, you know, this, this King James version, this is the truth. And um, so it's, uh, it, it can be a dangerous. It's, it's not only in religion, you know, it's in politics as well. Absolutely. I think the, uh, yeah. Because th this is why I can never um, abide it. When people say, we do not talk to terrorists. If you don't talk to them, what are they going to do? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that the only rational thing to do with terrorists is talk to them. You know, try, try to make contact. Try to provide them with some other way of behaving besides, mm. besides going that way. But you know, what we too often end up with this kind of terrorism on both sides. Yeah. Very interesting book. I don't know if you're familiar with Bruce Lincoln, who was a colleague of mine at the University of Chicago, a historian of religion. And he wrote a book on the rhetoric of George W. Bush and Osama bin Laden. Hmm. And uh, the, the symmetry <laughs> between them. Wow. <laughs> the wow. similarity. And by, mind you, we have heard much more extreme politicians than George W. Bush. <laughs> uh, yeah, words are dangerous. They really can be. Um, well, uh, we're, we're at, at about the half hour mark, and um, I want to give everybody else sort of a, a teaser. We've talked about violence, and that's really the big thing that I wanted to talk about. But I, I I want to give everybody again a bit of a teaser. What else is in this book? And it's just, um, it's so excellent. So if I could, I'm often asked about passages like Numbers 5 and Exodus 21, 22 to 25, and how they relate to the issue of abortion. So if you, this book goes into a lot of different um, issues that are very relevant today and you know what, what we do with the things that the biblical texts say about them. So could you give us a brief summary of these two passages, as brief as you like, uh, just so everybody can understand what they are, and what bearing they might have on the abortion discussion? Now, the one in Exodus 21 is the text that has traditionally been used as the, the proof text for debates about abortion. And it doesn't actually talk about abortion at all. It's, it posits a case where two men are fighting and incidentally, a woman is hit and she is pregnant and she loses the child. This is not abortion. Now, the way they, it treats of it then is, you know, what kind of compensation is due? So it isn't even re really dealing with it as a moral issue. Now, it becomes... Um, that becomes the, the go-to text, in large part because of the way it was translated into Greek. Because there's one difficult Hebrew word in it. It's the word for har, mason. And this got translated into Greek if the baby comes out not fully formed. And that became then the point on which the arguments hung. And in Jewish tradition, for a lot of the way, uh, I'm not sure, again, I don't know that there is one Jewish position on anything, uh, but certainly for a lot of the tradition, 
the position was that you could not have an abortion if the crown of the head had appeared. Now, so the, the point there was whether the fetus was fully formed. Now, these are very complex issues in a modern context, but the, the striking thing is it wasn't really aware of this when I started working on it, mm. uh, that the Bible never says anything about abortion. Mm. The other text you mentioned in Numbers 5 is, if you suspect a woman of adultery, give her a hideous mixture to drink of mixing clay and water, and uh, if it causes her to swell up, then she was guilty. Now, apparently what's going on there is that it would cause a miscarriage. Mm. You know, the, the only way it wouldn't was if she hadn't conceived a child at all. Right. <laughs> but, but again, now, if that is the case, then, then it would seem to be approving of abortion, mm. in fact approving of causing a miscarriage in a case of adultery. But it doesn't actually come out and say that. Right. And to me, the striking thing is that it never addresses that question. Now, the only people I think who had a law against us were your good friends, the Assyrians. Mm. And it wasn't, you would say, because of their great humaneness, for the most part. Uh, I think, you know, a lot of people in the ancient world viewed this more as a matter of property rights. Sure. And it wasn't so much the rights that there was no concept of a right to life. Mm -hmm. For that, of it, there wasn't really a concept of rights as such. You know, when you talk about rights, this is anthropocentric. It is, we have human rights because we are human beings. That's the idea. In the ancient world, for the Assyrians as well as for the Hebrews, it's what the gods say. Yeah. So it's theocentric. Now, uh, again, we mentioned Nick Walter's for already, and he makes a, a valiant effort to say that if God forbids you to do something to a person, then that person has a right for you not to do it to him. <laughs> but I think, again, it's a nice try, but you know, <laughs> this just isn't the way they think about it yeah. in the context of the Bible. So uh, now what, what would you conclude from this? Um, now, you see, I, I think it's really inconclusive. It is not the case, and I'm by no means suggesting that the Bible is saying abortion is okay. Just doesn't say anything about it. Mm. We do know that by the time you get down into the Hellenistic period, uh, Jews had a reputation that they were exceptional in the ancient world for not exposing infants. Mm. Now, exposing infants is different from abortion. You know, to expose an infant, the infant has to be born first. So this is the, there's a whole difference of degree there. Mm -hmm. But you can see if if you wanted, if I wanted to make an argument against abortion, it's the concern for vulnerable life would be the argument to make. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, this is not an argument that the that the Bible makes with regard to the unborn. And to my mind, then that throws this, you know, there is no divine command on this. Mm -hmm that one could possibly construe as such. And that means then it's a matter of negotiation mm -hmm. and that a society has to figure that out and people have a right to argue for whichever side they, they want to, but in the end, it, it is a matter for a human decision. Mm. And I think there's, there's so much of this that we looking at it through obviously our modern lens, doesn't make sense to us. So slavery, as we see it, and I want to ask about that sort of before we move into the Q and A. Um, but you know, I've, I've I wrote a book recently, a popular level book on slavery uh, in the ancient Near East and the Hebrew Bible. And one of the things that I, I see people wrestling with is that we know slavery is immoral. Like we we know that, 
And so when we see it in the Hebrew Bible, if it's, uh, or in the ancient Near East, if it's being uh, uh, either um, endorsed or in places condoned, whatever it, whatever word that we want to use, um, that it's being treated there as a moral issue. And I think that that's difficult um, to try to wrap our heads around that uh, slavery is not, it's, it's, it's being looked at in a different way. So if I could, um, because you, you do have a chapter on slavery as well, just for everybody, uh, go buy the book. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Another hot button issue with respect to the morality of the Hebrew Bible is the issue of slavery. It is often argued on social media that the slavery in the ancient world was indeed awful, but not in the Hebrew Bible. It is argued that slavery in the Hebrew Bible was simply akin to owning a credit card or having a job. Um, or perhaps being owned by a sports franchise. Is this how we should understand slavery in the Hebrew Bible? Well, uh, to my mind, you know, the essence of slavery is that one person is owned by somebody else. Now, even those poor slaves, you know, who work in the NFL or the NBA, uh, well, they, they get a little better remuneration, I think, than most slaves would have gotten in the ancient world. <laughs> and for that, there is really nothing to prevent them from picking up their gear and quitting. Yeah. Is what you could not do if you were a slave. How bad, in fact, was it? You know, we don't really know. We don't have very good data. Now, but we do have this moving passage in the book of Nehemiah, uh, when people go to Nehemiah and say, look, we're having to sell our children to pay the king's tax or to pay whatever tax. Now, it, that hurts. It doesn't matter whether the person you sell the child to is benign or not. Mm. And you know we don't have a lot of, of evidence of the abuse of slaves, but you see, we don't really know what would have counted as the abuse of slaves. Mm. In the book of Proverbs, they'll tell you to beat your slave. The book of Ben Sira tells you to beat your slave. Otherwise, you know, he's not going to respect you. Mm. In effect, they kind of treated slaves the way they treated their animals. Now, I'm sure there were some people who were decent human beings, and relatively kindly. There must have been some of those even in the American South. Mm. But now uh, we don't have the data, you know, to do an index of comparative misery. Uh, one of the times I taught this course at Yale Divinity School, there was an African-American gentleman in the class who was a bit older than most of the students. He was very good, very thoughtful but he could not accept that what you have in the Bible was slavery. Mm. And that's because, you know, the Bible was a treasured book. And if he accepted that it did condone slavery, th this was a big problem for him. Mm. And th there was an African-American woman in the class who I think explained things to him very nicely <laughs> and said, mm. you know, <laughs> Yeah, I see where you're coming from, but nonetheless, you got to look and see what the facts are here. Um, so, you know, granted that we don't really know how this treated them most of the time, what we do know is they could buy them and sell them. Mm. And that is degrading. That's yeah. degrading. That's worse than beating. So... Uh, why did I put in that chapter, as people, as several people have asked me? I put it in because I take it that is a case where no right-minded person will now read it and say, and the Bible was right. Mm. I think the, the other case where few people would want to take that stand would be with regard to women. Mm. For example, when you have in the pastoral epistles, I will not allow a woman to teach or have authority over men. Yep. I think you won't get many people who would actually stand up and say, I agree with that. Uh, now, I suspect there may be more people who actually think that in the case of women. Yeah. <laughs> but nobody in the modern world 
could conceivably, I think, get up and say slavery was a good thing. Yeah. Uh, but in fact, you see, they didn't see the problem, which is remarkable to us, given the whole Exodus story. But you see, it, people, you don't see things that everybody takes for granted. And we, we don't know now, you know, what our blind spots are that will be glaringly obvious to people 100 years from now. Yeah. But we can easily look back. We had a, a portrait on the walls of Yale Divinity School for a time of a man named Moses Stewart, who was one of the first prominent American biblical scholars. And he said, when he was asked, uh, the Bible does not condemn slavery. Mm. This was at the time of the Civil War. But he was right. Mm -hmm. You see, I mean, where he would have been wrong, and I'm not sure whether he did, but whether he drew the conclusion or not, but it would have been wrong to say, and therefore, it's okay. So that, to my mind, is the reason for including the chapter on slavery, which in many ways is anachronistic, in some ways perhaps not mm. so anachronistic, yeah. because it has its analogs. Still, because, you know, people are, uh, I mean, I think you could probably document some of this now with the COVID-19 crisis, you know, of the people who are not at liberty to shelter at home. Mm. And why is that? And, you know, I'm not saying any of these are simple issues, mm. but, but they're, not, uh, they're not black and white. Yeah. It's interesting. One of the things that we say on the channel all the time is if, if uh, particularly on a complex issue, if you think it's simple, you probably don't understand it. And uh, unfortunately, the case. Um, this has been fantastic. Um, uh, so Megan has emailed me the, uh, the questions and, um, you know, I, I promise to not go more than 15 minutes. If you need to get okay. get out of here earlier than that, please, please, uh, oh. you know, obviously feel free to do so, but, um, or 15 is the deadline. <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay. Um, so the first question, Dr. Collins and it, Feel free to answer as many or as few of these as you can or like. Uh, if the truth of the Bible disproved most existing theories about it, would you still want to know the truths of the Bible? This is a long question, by the way. There is an undeniable fact overlooked by scholars, and that is every single personal and place name in the Bible is made up of Arabic compound words which relay, uh, which relay with and add to the respective stories and specifically Old Arabic, Spo, you, you seem to disagree with this. Look, <laughs> the Bible was written before the Arabic language developed. This, I think, is a non-starter. Okay. But look, philology isn't really my thing mm -hmm. to that degree. Uh, I would defer that question to a Semitist. You know, if you get somebody like Dennis Pardee from the Oriental Institute in Chicago, or I'm sure you know a ton of them from Johns Hopkins, uh, let them deal with it on the philological level. Yeah. But to my mind, it's a non-starter. Understood. Um, Skeptics Propaganda writes or asks, what was the purpose of exterminating entire families in the narrative of the Hebrew Bible? Was it to eliminate the chance of survivors acting out blood vengeance, or do you suppose a different reason? You know, um, there, were, the, the, there could be more than one reason. Uh, you could also apply that question to what's the purpose of genocide, mm. you know, of trying to wipe out a whole people. And in that case, certainly um, to protect yourself from vengeance is part of it. But now in some cases, uh, there are issues of purity as well. You know that if you think the person, the family to be destroyed is somehow defiled, then you want to get rid of everything it touches. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. So, you know, in the story of Achan in the book of Joshua, I was just thinking that that. Only stone his whole family, but also the animals. So it doesn't have anything to do with the individual culpability of that the being that is being destroyed. It has to do with the, the uh, perception of a kind of extended guilt. It used to be fashionable to speak of corporate personality. And I think people nowadays wouldn't use that kind of language for it. But the, the story of Akan is a good example, you know, that the if the man is guilty, his whole house is guilty. And that that is the way they think of things. Mm-hmm. You know, that they don't have in especially in the early part of the Hebrew Bible, you don't have the kind of individualistic outlook that we do in the modern world. Mm-hmm. You know, in some ways, actually, uh, that there may have been some good things about that, but there certainly were some liabilities with it too. Yeah, that's good. Um, Carlos Rodriguez asks, how does the violence condoned or commanded in the Old Testament compare to violence that might have been typical among Israel's ancient Near Eastern neighbors? I think we addressed that a little bit. Is there anything else you wanted to say about that? Well, you know, the case of the, the Herem, which you mentioned, uh, which you get in Joshua or in, uh, in Deuteronomy as well, the command, you know, for of total destruction. Now, we also have that in an inscription from, uh, from Moab. Now, again, we don't know whether the Moabites actually did it. They also may have been indulging in hyperbole. <laughs> but you see, if that is the kind of rhetoric that you use it at least glorifies that mm-hmm. kind of thing. So you know, I would think uh, that it was common enough in the ancient Near East. Very hard to get statistics yeah. on it. I yeah. think the Israelites probably had fewer opportunities to do it than people like the Assyrians, maybe even the, the Moabites. But when they got a chance, they could yeah. rise to the occasion. And I think that's something that we we all need to realize is that when you think about royal inscriptions or you think about these these types of rhetorical texts that um, are being produced, they're they're doing something, and certainly uh, that their intent in many cases certainly is to get Hammurabi is indulging, right? He's he's yeah. he's he's building himself up, but he's doing it for a reason. He 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 wants to portray that this is actually the case. What he's doing, uh, Urukagina in the third millennium, doing the same sort of thing. It's not that they're trying to say, "All right, I'm using rhetoric here, so don't believe what I'm saying." It's I'm using rhetoric so that you will believe these things about me. Right. So people still do this. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thinking of certain people uh, at the moment, uh, a certain person. Sorry, some more than others. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, Valentine asks, how much knowledge of biblical history do you think people who espouse Judeo-Christian values have, and how much do contemporaries really share? Oh, probably very little. I think that that's generally the the case. Uh, In my experience, you know, a lot of the people who are most eager to impress you with their belief in biblical authority have never really read it. Yeah. Um, back to take a, a fairly innocent example of that. Early in my career, I was teaching at DePaul University in Chicago. And there was a young man who was about six feet, 10 inches tall. He was on the basketball team. He had a career afterwards. You might know his name if I mentioned it. Um, But he said on television that he had come to DePaul so he could study Bible. And sure enough, he ended up in my class. He was a kind of self-ordained minister in a church on the south side of Chicago. And he preached regularly. But when he tried to do exams in the Hebrew Bible, it came, you know, you say you push a button and there's a certain flow of rhetoric that would come out. And he said to me one day when I was trying to explain to him what was wrong with it, because he really was a nice guy. But he said, man, 
could I just do it my way? <laughs> I think there are an awful lot of uh, Christians, maybe I can't speak for Jews so much. Um, you know, in modern Israel, I'm not so sure. I think they, they probably know a certain amount of biblical history. Mm -hmm. If you live in modern Israel, what do you do uh, on a holiday or something? Well, you go around, there are so many sites in the country, you know, that you can hardly live there without being aware of the past. But no, that's no guarantee that all of them have what I would call a critical awareness of the mm, past. Yeah. <laughs> and I think the more committed people are to a fairly totalizing kind of religion, which would certainly be true of some of the Orthodox and as it is of some groups in Christianity, uh, then I think the less likely you are to pay attention to little things like historical mm. facts. I do remember uh, when I was in seminary, um, I think it was my first year actually, and I wrote a paper on Hebrews chapter six. And they always had everybody write a, pass, a, a paper on Hebrews six, four through six, because you know, for a, for a conservative school, that was a very, it's a very difficult passage to try to figure out. And they, they knew no one would know the answer because there wasn't one. Um, but of course I knew the answer because I was, you know, I, I was brilliant and young. <laughs> and I remember, I remember I handed in the paper with a certain smugness and uh, my professor handed it back and it looked as though a goat had been sacrificed on it. There was so <laughs> much red ink. And at the end he wrote, but really good try, you know, and I remember feeling so sorry for him because he didn't understand what I understand. It's um, it's fun to look back on those days and realize just how little what you knew. Was that? Hmm. What seminary did you it go was to? It was Capital Bible Seminary, just outside of DC. It's uh, it was bought out by Lancaster Bible College, I think. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I got my master's of theology there, um, mm -hmm. and then went to Hopkins, and yeah, a slightly different view on things. You know, uh, yes, but I would say this much for the conservative seminaries that very often they get people started on the languages. Yes. And that generally speaking, uh, the students who come out of those places have no trouble finding a biblical passage. Yep, yep. Which I still do sometimes, having not come through that kind. <laughs> I, I know by the time I was done, I mean, I taught Hebrew for two years. I taught the Hebrew cycle while I was there in my last two years, but I had... Hebrew, uh, obviously Greek, Aramaic. I'd taken Targumic Aramaic, Biblical Aramaic, and I took some Syriac, a little bit of Ugaritic, and Akkadian. I mean, they were huge on the languages. So um, very quickly, because I know you've got to go. Uh, uh, does the new book uh, cover views on homosexuality? Yes, it does. That's a great section. Um, uh, okay, I know, let's see. Um, I'm just trying to make sure that the, the questions are on point. Um, okay, just one, then some comments. Uh, I know the older texts actually have the Red Sea being the Sea of Reeds. Could that be an Israelite joke on Egyptian afterlife field of reeds or some sort of play on that concept that the Egyptians were thoroughly killed? Uh, you know, uh, I don't think, uh, I don't think so. Uh, I think Sea of Reeds is probably a fair enough translation. The Yam Suf. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a professor, he's surely retired now, I haven't heard of him for a while, and then Bernard Battle, uh, who wrote an article arguing that the Yam Suf was the Yam Sof, you know, the Sea of the End. Mm. You know, I mean, that's actually the kind of wordplay that you might expect them to come up with sometimes, but I'm not sure that you don't really have the idea of a sea of the of an end mm -hmm. that early yeah. in the, the material. But no, I don't think so. Um, now you know the whole question of the historicity of the Exodus is a very complicated question, but. Uh, I subscribe to the view that the poetry of Exodus 15 is older than the prose. Mm. 
Mm. But the prose is an attempt to kind of translate it into a rational sequence. Mm -hmm. But that it was originally poetic and that quite possibly nobody got wet. Mm. Yeah. But again, that's by the way, that's that doesn't really have anything to do with this book. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just three quick comments. Uh, Scott Duke says, thanks for the consistently amazing content. And that is all Doctor uh, due to Dr. Collins here. So thank you. Uh, Michael Apple says, love Dr. Collins' new book uh, or book on Daniel, recently finished. Uh, no specific questions, just happy to support such fantastic content. Thank you so much. And uh, Michael Kiram writes, a shout out to Dr. Collins for being a guest here on Digital Hammurabi. So I, I can't thank you enough. We had uh, Dr. Brendan Benz on last week or this weekend to talk about the Canaanites, which was a lot of fun. Uh, Dr. Joel Baden will be on, I think in a, maybe a month. I'm not sure if it's been set up yet to talk about yeah, formation of the Pentateuch. I guarantee it. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, of course, I'd, I'd, I'd love to have you come back on, but after this debacle, I'm not sure you want to, <laughs> you want to, <laughs> but obviously I did a series on the dating of Daniel and, um, and, uh, you know, structured, uh, my arguments based on your 93 uh, commentary. So, of course, adding to, you know, more recent stuff, but uh, obviously it was the core. So you're very popular on this channel and I really appreciate you coming on and thank you for everybody for watching. Um, and if there's anything you'd like to say before we close out, please do so. It was a pleasure to be on and uh, really nice to see what you look like. <laughs> yeah, we, Dr. Collins and I have interacted a little bit on email and uh, he's been very gracious and gets back, uh, got back to me very quickly, which I was surprised, but uh, could just because you're such a, you're such a big name uh, and I'm very sorry, I feel like I'm gushing a little here, but uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Collins, so much for coming on and uh, I'll go ahead and end the stream here, but everyone, thank you for watching and until next time, resist poor scholarship. Always ask, how do you know that? Bye, everyone. Yes. <laughs>